Good morning, a very happy Easter to you all. Please join in the response of greeting. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad of Everybody, my name is Sue. It is so good to be able to chat to you today. We are going to start with a game. This game is called Who Am I? This is how it's going to work. I am going to think of something in my head and I am going to give you clues. You have to use the clues to work out what it is I'm thinking about, who I am thinking about. So I'll give you a clue, then you can have a think and maybe guess an answer, tell your friends or your family, whoever's around you. Um, and then I'll give you another clue and we'll see at the end how many clues it took you to guess the right answer. Are you ready? Here we go. Here's our first clue. It's an animal. It's an animal. Had a guess? Okay, next clue. Um, it could be big or it could be little. It could be big or it could be little. Have another guess. Here's another clue. Um, it's black. Oh, but it could be brown or white or a mix of all those colours. Have another guess. What do you think? Here's another clue. It usually lives in homes with people. It usually lives in homes with people. Have you got an idea now? Have a guess. Here's your last clue. It goes woof woof. You've got it now, haven't you? I bet you have. It's a dog. I was thinking about my dog, Oscar. Here he is. I wonder how many clues it took you to guess that correctly. Well, in the Bible, I've got my Bible here, we meet a man called Nathaniel. And I think Nathaniel would have been really great at our game. I think it would just have taken him a few, cl few clues to guess what I was thinking about. And that's because when Nathaniel meets Jesus, Jesus gives him just two clues and Nathaniel knows exactly who Jesus is. With just two clues, Nathaniel's got it. He's figured out who Jesus is. You see, when Nathaniel meets Jesus, the first thing Jesus says to him is, you are an Israelite and a good Israelite. Nathaniel's never met Jesus before, so that's his first clue that Jesus knows all about him, even though he's never met him. Jesus knows all about him. 
And then the second clue is Jesus says, I saw you at the fig tree with your, before you met your friend. And Nathaniel knows Jesus wasn't there. So he knows that Jesus is saying, even when I'm not there, I know where you are and I know what you're doing. That's the second clue. Well, Nathaniel is amazed, but straight away, after just those two clues, he's got the answer and he's excited, excited about it. He shouts it out. He says, Jesus, you are rabbi. That means teacher. I've got a whiteboard and a marker like a teacher would have. Um, so he says, teacher. He knows Jesus is a teacher. But he doesn't stop there because he knows Jesus isn't just a teacher. He says, you are the son of God. Mm, I've got a cross and a stone, like the stone that was rolled away from Jesus' tomb to remind us that Jesus is the son of God. He had the power to die, but then come alive again. Nathaniel knows that Jesus is a teacher and the son of God, but he doesn't stop there. Then he says, you are the king of Israel. And I've got a crown. <laughs> With only two clues, Nathaniel knows exactly who Jesus is. He knows he is a teacher, rabbi, he calls him. He knows he is the son of God. That's my pebble. And he knows he is a king. And that's what I would like you all to remember today just who Jesus is, that he is a teacher. We can learn from him. He's going to teach us about God and the world and how to live, but he's more than just a teacher. He's also the son of God. He was with God when God made the world. He's with God in heaven now. He's got God's power. Remember, he could do all those miracles and he came alive again so that we could be friends with God. And finally, he's a king Ooh, and we should let him be king of our lives. We should worship him and we should listen to him and obey him. Jesus, let me see if I can get all these in my hands, is a teacher, the son of God and our king.
The Resurrection Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, They have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. Then they went home. Amen.
Heavenly Father, we come before you this Easter morning with brimming hearts. We give thanks for the blessing of new life which you have given to each of us through the gift of your resurrection. When did we first understand the magnitude of your sacrifice? When did we comprehend, truly comprehend, your suffering? Was it rolling eggs down a hill to represent the stone rolling back from your tomb? Was it when we first learned the words of Lord of the Dance? We danced in the day when the sky turned back. Was it visiting the Kelvin Grove Art Gallery and gazing upon the painting Christ St. John of the Cross by Salvador Dali? Or was it when we heard you cry, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Today we pray for all those who feel forsaken in life, living with pain, frustration, poverty, hunger, and fear. We pray that by your grace they can retain hope and that things will change for them in their lifetime. We pray for our own strength and our faith that we may not forsake those who need us most. Help us to be a witness to the world, Lord, and not to turn a blind eye. We pray for those whose hearts have petrified through hurt or loneliness or grief. Help us to be the kindness and love they need to heal. We pray for our nation, our communities, and our leaders, especially David and Paul, for the wisdom, joy, and comfort they bring to our congregation. Thank you, Lord, for days such as this, manifesting every promise of spring. Thank you for this submersion in the new, daffodils trumpeting, violets peeking, Lichen, colouring, bark and stone. This Easter day, this new beginning, lift our heads, our hearts, our eyes and our voices. Because from the greatest suffering came our greatest joy. Our Lord Jesus Christ is risen and there is hope. Thank you, dear God. Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Alan Lewis, who is a writer and a theologian, describes Easter as the boundary between yesterday and tomorrow. And that's a good description because for Mary Magdalene and the other disciples, it was the boundary between yesterday and tomorrow. They wondered what had happened yesterday and the day before on Good Friday, and they wondered what would happen tomorrow and next. And trying to make sense of it, some people tried to give explanations, but it was soon quite obvious that these explanations just were played wrong, and they just didn't fit the facts. Some people, for example, explain the empty tomb by saying there had been grave robbers. Now, it wasn't just in the days of Burke and Hare that graves were robbed, but in the ancient world as well. In fact, it was so serious a crime that the emperor had outlawed it with death. Rather ironic that if you robbed a grave, you would end up in one if you were caught. And the inscription describing that from the emperor was found by an archaeologist in no less a place than Nazareth. Isn't that a strange twist of archaeological humour or whatever it is? Archaeology has its own humour. You know, it's as if they were saying there's no point in stealing the body of the man from Nazareth because there was no body in the tomb. Graves which were plundered were also always the graves of rich people. Robbers didn't want the body, they wanted the person's grave goods, the treasures and personal possessions which were buried with them. 
Think of the, the tombs of Egypt, the pharaohs. Why were they wrong? Not just because somebody was there looking for their money, but rather because they were looking for the treasures that were in Think of Tutankhamun's, which of course wasn't plundered and the amazing things that were in it. So why would anybody bother to rob the grave of the Son of Man who had nowhere to lay his head? And anyway, once the rumours and stories of Jesus rising and circulated, all the authorities had to do to disprove them would be to produce the body. But they didn't. They couldn't. Why not? Because it was no longer there. <coughs> Another so-called explanation was that Jesus wasn't really risen. It was just a ghost that the disciples had seen. Or maybe he'd been just taken into heaven in some kind of miraculous way like some people before him. There are examples in the Bible. Elijah went up in a fiery chariot and a whirlwind. And what about Enoch? That strange character Enoch. It says about him, he walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Or even Melchizedek, perhaps even stranger from Genesis and, and mentioned in the book of Hebrews, who is described as without father or mother, without ancestors having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling a son of God. These were all examples of people in the Bible who didn't seem to die in a normal way. But that was quite different from the experience of Jesus. He did die. And people like Elijah and Enoch and Melchizedek and so on, they were especially holy people, and that's why God took them, if you like, directly up to heaven on the express one-way ticket. They didn't go through the normal experience of death, as far as we can see. With Jesus, it was different. The grave clothes, including the head covering in the tomb, were proof that Jesus had risen. That's what the disciples saw when he came back with Mary Magdalene. He saw these things and it says he believed. This was no ghost. And also Jesus is someone who could be touched. We all know the story later on, shortly after this, of Thomas, who uh, had his own doubts about the whole thing and was invited to touch the wounds of Jesus. This is our reading for next Sunday. But Mary seems to be clasping on to Jesus in the garden as well in our reading today. And she's told by Jesus, don't touch me, or sometimes translated, don't hold on to me. It was a, a Star Trek moment. Mary's told not to be a Klingon. Instead, she's to boldly go and tell the disciples what happened. Don't hang on to the earth of Jesus. He is still to ascend. Instead, go and tell the others. It must have been hard for Mary to grasp that when she was grasping onto perhaps Jesus' feet, which had so recently been anointed. But she's told that's not what to do. Ben Withington says of this, we are people of the resurrection, and because of this old things keep passing away and we must not cling on to them. If our God is a God of resurrection, the real problem is not finding God in the past, much less dwelling there, but rather catching up with a God who has so far outdistanced us and our obsolescent ways of thinking. In other words, don't, don't look in the empty tomb, don't look in the grave for Jesus. Look ahead. He's already gone ahead. And he says in the Gospels, he goes ahead of them to Galilee and he then meets with them there on a mountain. So this was no ghost. In fact, as well as touching Jesus, you know later on in John's Gospel, he eats with them at the seashore in Galilee when they're cooking fish, when there was a catch of fish by the fishermen. And the final mistake that Mary made was that she mistook Jesus for the gardener. Now there's a painting, which Rembrandt did in 1638. Thanks, Andrew. And it's not, a dim, it's not very, very bright, especially in today's lovely sunlight. But you can probably just make out that Jesus is there, and Mary Magdalene kind of turning around. And Rembrandt has Jesus carrying a trowel or a spade, and he's wearing a straw hat. 
And I wonder if that was Rembrandt's explanation of why Mary thought he was the gardener. Well, no wonder if he was dressed like that and carrying a spade in his hand. But you know, we can probably understand her mistake. Because you can imagine, well, it was a garden. John says that he was buried in a place where there was a garden. You might expect someone to come round and tend the garden, as people would do today, or as people today might do in a cemetery, tending the flowers and so on. And in the pale light of dawn, with tears in her eyes, Mary was trying to make sense of what had happened. No wonder she assumed it was a garden. But she would soon realise that the man wasn't the person weeding the garden, but the man who created the garden of it all. She wasn't completely wrong. In the first garden of creation, the one we call the Garden of Eden, God walked there, tending the garden with Adam and Eve. And in this next garden, the Garden of Resurrection, we could call it, he was the one walking around, looking after his people. The first Garden of Eden was a garden of disobedience and loss. This garden was a garden of resurrection, a garden of obedience and salvation. Jesus was indeed a kind of a garden, and how? But notice what she calls him, teacher, Rabboni is the Aramaic word. Rabbi is more familiar to us, that's the Hebrew, and it literally means my great one. The idea being that the teacher is almost greater than the pupil. Rabboni is just the Aramaic, we have seen that, my teacher. And although that's true, Jesus was her teacher and our teacher. That name or that title isn't really enough for him at this stage, is it? And so even by the time she brushed back to the other disciples, she says, not I've seen the teacher, she says, I have seen the Lord, the Lord. No longer just a teacher, but her Lord. And soon Thomas will refer to Jesus as my Lord and my God. What do we think of Jesus? What names do we use of him? What titles do we give him? I sometimes get circular letters addressed to Mr. Church because they think my name is Abby Church. <laughs> ben Witherington, the man I quoted a minute ago, and I'll quote him again in a minute when I finish, his full name is Ben Witherington III, and I guess that's because his father and his grandfather were also called Ben Witherington. And he says in his commentary that he often gets things addressed to Mr. Third. Well, sometimes we can get the names wrong. But let's not make that mistake with Jesus. Is he our teacher and only that? Just a good man, just a wise teacher? Or is he, as Mary recognised, our Lord? And as Thomas said, our Lord and our God. In any case, what Mary was told to do was to go back and spread the news among the disciples. And she was the first one to do that, the first witness of the early tomb. And we might say the first evangelist of the Easter message, the first Easter preacher. And that's what God wants us to do with the message as well. He doesn't want us to be staring at the empty tomb or clinging on to the earthly Jesus, as Mary was tempted to do. He wants us to go. He wants us to head off and tell others of the good news. As Witherington puts it, we must always ask, what new thing is God doing? And what would he have us do to be effective witnesses for Christ in our own age and place? Glory be to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever, world without end.
Die for